Our, uh, our first speaker for this afternoon is Frank De La Teja. Frank is a professor of history at Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos. He specializes in colonial northern Mexico, the social and economic development of northeastern New Spain, land acquisition, and culture patterns in colonial and Mexican Texas, and political interaction between the Tejanos and the Anglo-Americans. He's a prolific author, written 14 books and articles. His uh, book on a revolution remembered, the memoirs and selected correspondence of Juan Seguin is going to be republished and will be out in, in print with a new introduction next month. Um, he's also a book review editor of the Southwestern Historical Quarterly and a member of the Executive Council of the Texas State Historical Association. Uh, when we look at the Battle of San Jacinto and all the complex issues that we've been discussing, uh, not only do we have the uh, Texan side, uh, the Anglo-Texan side, and the Mexican side, but we also have the very unique aspect of the Hispanics from, uh, from San Antonio, the, these Tejanos, uh, serving in the Texas Army. And that is the subject of Frank's talk. He is one of the leading experts, if not the leading experts on this subject. His topic is Juan Seguin and his Tejano company at San Jacinto. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. De La Teja. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you all for uh, sticking around after lunch. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to warn you, I'm one of those revisionist <laughs> historians. The, um, the bottom line is, I think, that uh, the word revisionist gets tossed around as a way to set up uh, straw men. Uh, all historians, after the first one that writes on a topic, Everybody who writes on that topic afterwards is revising what the first one did. So we're all revisionists. Um, and starting with uh, the topic at, uh, at hand, the Battle of San Jacinto, um, and, and there, um, there I go revising again, it's not San Jacinto, it's uh, San Jacinto, St. Hyacinth in English. Um, there were Tejanos on both sides. And when I use the word Tejano during my paper here, I'm referring, of course, to the, the Hispanic population of Texas, which, whether born here, and some of the people who participated in the battle were third, fourth, or even fifth generation Texans, or having arrived during the uh, Mexican period uh, between 1821 and 1836, um, considered themselves part of that uh, Hispanic part of the Texan population that I, I'll refer to in my paper as Tejano. I also would like for you to bear with me. I'm going to read my paper. That way all my arguments make sense, um, <laughs> I think, or I hope, um, rather than uh, just trying to uh, cover uh, it off the top of my head, which, which never works because the top of my head is usually has 15 or 20 things floating in it. So here we go. Um, and uh, at the, I think we're going to have a few minutes at the very end of this afternoon, since we've already started late this afternoon, I would much prefer that we do question and answers at the very end, and that way it'll expedite the other papers. There were, assuming the available muster roll and Sam Houston's and Ed Burleson's accounts are accurate, 21 Tejanos at the Battle of San Jacinto. 20 made up Captain Juan N. Seguin's cavalry company, which fought on foot that day. They were joined by a recent recruit named Juan Lopez in his 1875 affidavit in support of a Texas pension. Lopez told a story that I'd like to relate to you. John Rosenheimer, Bear County notary, reported that Lopez, quote, was born at Natchitoches in the state of Louisiana on or about the year 1819, that his parents were originary from Yucatan and had been transferred to Louisiana by orders of the Spanish government. That with several other families from these former provinces in view of settling that contested border. That he remained with his parents who were settled in the country not far from Natchitoches till the death of his parents, his mother having died in childbed and his father having been killed a short time after in a fight against Indians. Affiant remained an orphan and entirely destitute at the age of about 15 years. 
He joined a train of American carts and arrived at Nacogdoches in the latter part of the year 1835. Sometime after, finding himself out of occupation, he was accepted as cart driver in a body of Texian troops raised and commanded as much as affiant can make out by a Captain Henry Teal, or Till, or Teal. These troops had in view of coming to the support of the Texian forces that were retreating before the Mexican army under the command of General Santa Ana. The party joined the Texian forces at Harrisburg and the first military service rendered by Affiant was to volunteer his services to, the help, to help in crossing the artillery and other military stores to the left bank of Buffalo, and I'll, I'll try to pronounce it in good Houstonian fashion, Bile. <laughs> There's a story there. <laughs> It was at Harrisburg that Affiant became acquainted with some of the men belonging to the company of J.N. Seguin. On the second and last day of the fighting at San Jacinto, Affiant, who was on the spot and without any rifle, picked up an old sword, and having joined the men of Seguin's company, whom he considered as being more his countrymen than the other troops, in reason of their language, he entered the battlefield with his sword till he was ordered to lay hold of a musket rifle belonging to one of the men who, claiming to be sick and unable to fight, was laying on the ground. He abided by the order and fought till he received a flush wound on the extern part of his left knee. The scar of said wound is yet apparent. Why the long excerpt from this common soldier's affidavit? because it is one of the rarest of documents, a Tejano account of the events of April 20th, 21st, 1836. The account by Antonio Menchaca, Seguin's sergeant, is brief. Seguin's, by far the longest, is only a couple of pages long. All three accounts, however, make clear the pride these men felt in having fought for Texas independence at San Jacinto. The record of the battle makes clear that the Tejanos who fought under Seguin's command that day did so with competence, enthusiasm, and valor. Who were the Tejanos who served under Juan Seguin? Lopez, our intrepid teenager, was not born in Texas. He had not arrived until late 1835. He was, in fact, like most of the others who participated in the battle, a recent immigrant from the United States, fighting more for an idea presented to him by his leaders than anything else. He, like most of the Texians who fought at San Jacinto, had no property in Texas, no sophisticated sense of the politics behind the revolt against Mexican rule, and certainly no concept of the repercussions of his actions. Lopez was a Tejano because, as he makes clear in his statement, Despite his Louisiana birth and recent arrival, he felt more comfortable among men who were most like him in language, customs, and appearance. As for the other Tejanos at San Jacinto, they represented mostly San Antonio. The names Seguin, Menchaca, Flores, Rodriguez, and Arocha are among the earliest Texas surnames. These names date back to the founding expeditions of 1716 and 1718, and to the migration of 15 Canary Islands families in 1731. To put it simply, the Tejanos who served under Juan were the native-born Texans at San Jacinto. As for Juan Seguin, he had organized a company of Tejanos for the struggle against General Cos in San Antonio the previous fall, had entered the Alamo when Santa Ana arrived to reclaim the wayward province in February, only to escape with a plea for assistance. In fact, he was on his way to Goliad in search of reinforcements for the Alamo when he met one of Fannin's officers who insisted help was on its way. After a meeting with Sam Houston at Gonzales, he reorganized his company, helping to protect the rear of the retreating Texans during the runaway scrape. 
If there was an individual at San Jacinto who could claim to have been the Forrest Gump of the Texas War of Independence, it was Juan Seguin. Young, energetic, and on the right side, Seguin's prominent participation in the military events of 1835-36 and his subsequent service in the Congress of the Republic assured him a small place in Texas history, one of very few 19th century Tejanos so honored. Full participation of the Tejano contribution, appreciation of the Tejano contribution, has been long in coming. Simply put, there existed a tendency to subsume Tejano motives within those of the Anglo-Texans. For instance, although in his biography of Stephen F. Austin, Eugene Barker recognized that there were Tejanos important to the cause of Anglo-American colonization, he and, and Texas historians who followed him focused mostly on the struggle between the colonists and the far off Mexican authorities. For these historians, the Federalist Centralist struggle was merely a passing phase of expedient political thinking on the part of the Texians while on the road to true independence. Mexican Texans either supported or opposed the cause. I'm glad to say that the historical landscape is on, in the process of transformation. Over the last few years, a number of works on Texas during the Mexican period have appeared taking considerable notice of the Tejano population. Aside from my own work, including A Revolution Remembered, Stephen Hardin's Texian Iliad, Paul Lack's The Texas Revolutionary Experience, Andres Tijerina's Tejanos in Texas Under the Mexican Flag, the book edited by Gerald Pollo, Tejano Journey, 1770 to 1850, and Tim Matovina's Tejano Religion and Ethnicity, San Antonio, 1821-1860, as well as a number of articles and essays represent a current generation of historians seeking to incorporate the story of Mexican Texans in the state's history of the Mexican period. These works have found a more sophisticated audience, although small, eager to grasp a richer, if less hagiographic, understanding of the state's past. What these recent works have in common is a willingness to reject simplistic dichotomies between Anglo and Mexican, democratic and tyrannical, even Catholic and Protestant, for more complex explanations interweaving economic, social, and political factors. In the search for fuller understanding, then, we must credit the Tejanos with having as varied and complex a set of motivations as had the Texians for being at San Jacinto. Because the fighting had concentrated around San Antonio, they were fighting for hearth and family as much as any Texian. Many, undoubtedly, were as loyal to the families of their leaders as to their leaders' causes. Ruben Rendon Lozano, in his 1936 booklet, Viva Tejas, Mexican-born patriots of the Republic of Texas, addresses this issue when he states, quote, all of these men of Seguin's company had joined the Texan cause through his influence. When Juan asked them to fight for the revolt against bad government in Mexico City, they willingly joined the cause. When he committed himself to independence after March 2nd, 1836, those loyal to him stayed in the fight. If Juan's leadership was at least partially responsible for the participation of his men at San Jacinto, and if the social and economic conditions of the previous quarter century contributed to their motivation, then Juan's family history can serve as a good vehicle to understanding how he and his men came to the field of St. Hyathan on April 21st, 1836. Just what was Juan's pedigree? His father, Erasmo, who served as Texas representative to the Constitu Constitutional Convention of 1823-1824 and helped draft the document on behalf of which Texas war, the War of Independence was launched, came, claimed Pedro Ocon y Trillo, a soldier in 1720s San Antonio, as his great-grandfather. Erasmo's grandfather, Bartolomé, a carpenter by trade, had arrived in San Antonio in the 1740s and married Luisa Oconitrillo, Pedro's daughter, in the 1750s. Both these men rose to economic and political prominence in the community, including holding places on the city council. 
Erasmo's father, Santiago, began the ranching tradition in the family, acquiring through inheritance from his grandfather a herd of cattle. By the 1770s, he was one of the city's leading stockmen. Santiago also began another family tradition, political activism. In 1787, he signed a memorial accusing former Governor Domingo Cabello of defrauding Bejareños of their cattle, and in 1790, organized an unauthorized citizens meeting to demand payment for those who participate in, in reconstructing the town's jail. Ultimately, Santiago's run-ins with the authorities led to his moving his family to Saltillo, leaving behind a young but eager Erasmo whose commitment to public service proved no less controversial than that of his father. Erasmo's public service career began in the years immediately preceding the Mexican War of Independence. He was all about 25 years old when he became postmaster of San Antonio in 1807. Like other prominent Tejanos, he found it difficult to avoid the maelstrom of the Mexican War of Independence and suffered loss of property and position following accusations of treason to the crown. He recovered his status sufficiently by 1820 so that he was elected alcalde, and the following year, Governor Martinez appointed him to the delegation sent to bring Moses Austin the news that his colonization project had been approved. The pinnacle of Erasmus' public fortunes came in 1823-24 when he represented Texas at the Constitutional Congress that drafted the Federal Constitution of 1824. He returned to San Antonio to be appointed quartermaster for Bejar, and the, in the early years of the Republic, he performed one final public service acting as a magistrate in Bear County. Erasmo then was a respected and well-off member of the San Antonio community a friend of Stephen F. Austin and the Anglo-American colonists who served three governments in the course of his lifetime. If the fortunes of the Seguin family had ultimately risen from the ashes of the Mexican War of Independence, the same could not be said of Texas as a whole. The 19th century had opened with a marked degree of instability and things had gone downhill from there. Tensions first rose as refugees from the Louisiana Purchase sought to establish themselves in Texas rather than come under U.S. rule. These people were joined by an increasing number of Native American groups that sought the shelter of Spanish territory, having lost their lands to land-hungry white settlers. The Crown had made its own contribution to the situation by sending hundreds of troops into the province without adequately providing for their upkeep. When Hidalgo launched his revolt in 1810, the flow of money and Indian gifts dried up, leaving the military ill-equipped to mount an adequate defense against Texas's independent tribes, which went on the warpath to gain by force those goods the government now denied them. To the native raiders from the plains was added filibusters and insurgents from the east. The Gutierrez Magui expedition of 1812-1813 was followed by the occupation of Galveston Island by privateers, including Jean and Pierre Lafitte, the establishment of a French colony on the Trinity, the efforts of James Long, and the establishment of squatter colonies along the Red River. Bringing devastation to the province, all of these events spelled trouble for Mexican Texas. In such an environment was Juan Seguin born and raised. Given the circumstances, Juan's youth was a very insecure one. The one constant was his father, who must have provided Juan with his education, given the absence of a school in San Antonio for all but a short period during this time. It was an education that included a heavy dose of civics. Juan's later teen years were spent helping his mother run the San Antonio post office while his father was away in Mexico City attempting to find a place for Texas in its increase and its increasing number of Anglo-American residents in the new nation. In one letter to his wife, a letter Juan surely read, Erasmo taught a valuable lesson by example. Quote, I have no money, but I am not hungry. And even if I were, I would not ask for assistance from my province, for she is in a condition to receive and not to give. More importantly, as surrogate for his father in Texas during this time, Juan had to deal with public officials, family business associates, and the Anglo-American settlers. 
In a short letter to Stephen Austin in April 1825, the 19-year-old Seguin informs the impresario that his father will soon arrive from Mexico with good news regarding his mission on behalf of the colonists. He addresses the Anglo-American in a confident and familiar tone, making a present of a copy of the new federal constitution, but asking that Austin return the accompanying newspapers. In a postscript, Juan even admonishes Austin not to forget, quote, to tell me if you have received the correspondence I sent you, as well as that which I send you now. Consequently, Juan learned about Anglo-Americans from his dealings with the Austins and treated them as his equals. Juan's education in civics was very different from that of his Anglo-American friends. While Austin and his colonists had been born into a Republican society, albeit one with the contradiction of slavery at the heart of its socioeconomic system, Juan had been born into a monarchical system in which representative government was limited to the town council and voting restricted to status within the community. He had matured during the birth of Mexico as a nation state, a process in which competing forms, monarchical, so centralized republic and decentralized democracy were still being experimented with and fought over. Fundamental questions of citizenship, individual rights, and the status of old corporate groups such as the church and the military required answers. Juan took his cue from his father's position on these and other issues to reach a position that emphasized local interests. Texas had suffered much, most importantly from a lack of investment in people, and Erasmus Seguin worked hard at the Constituent Congress to make sure that the doors to the settlement of Texas were opened and kept that way. He also worked to make sure that Texans retained as much decision-making power as possible. In Mexico, which briefly experimented with the same type of partyless political system that the framers of the U.S. Constitution hoped to promote, elites soon split between those that supported the kinds of strong states' rights approach I just mentioned and those who supported a strong national government in which the states were little more than administrative units. The first group became known as the Federalists because they advocated a federated form of national government in which the states exercised most authority, while the second group became known as the Centralists because they would place all real power in a national government. In effect, Erasmus' political philosophy and therefore his sons fell in line with that of the Federalists, who saw the country's future in a union of states enjoying significant authority over local resources and development issues. Consequently, Juan was a Federalist by training and conviction long before he reached political maturity and independently of Anglo-American influences. Forced to deal with the family's business affairs while his father was away, Juan matured quickly in judgment and character. His father trusted him to make an important business trip to New Orleans in 1826, when he was not yet 20 years old. A further sign of mature, this maturity was his election at age 22 to San Antonio's town council for 1829, a feat made all the more significant because at that time the city was entitled to only two councilmen. Successful in business and politics, Juan showed an eagerness to serve as a leader of the San Antonio Society as well. In late 1832, he helped organize and served as president of a society, the purpose of which was to mount theatrical performances in town. Trained in the ways of community leadership, the young Seguin did not shy away from either responsibility or from difficult ideological choices. The other men, Play, that other men placed their trust in him is proven by his winning the post of Electoral Assembly Secretary in 1833 with 26 out of 33 votes. The following year was, however, the beginning of Juan's engagement with national politics and the real test of his convictions. Elected to serve as the city's alcalde in 1834, on January 1st he found himself not taking up the staff of the magistrate's office, but accepting the post of interim jefe politico for the department of Bejar. At age 27, Juan was the chief political officer for his part of Texas. It was during his time of service that the Federalist-Centralist struggle heated up 
both in Coahuila, Texas, and the rest of the nation. Just a few days into office, Juan received the news that Austin had been arrested for having written a seditious letter to the town councils of Texas proposing that Texas split from Coahuila with or without the national government's authority. The news must have saddened him, especially as the, re as the, rest, uh, the arrest was made by order of Mexico's Federalist interim president, Valentin Gomez Farias. But Juan did nothing at this time to inject himself into what was still a matter of interpretation between the Anglo colonists and the national government. As the year progressed, however, the Federalist centralist struggle turned into open rebellion, putting Juan in a difficult position. In May, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana switched political affiliations and now acting as a centralist under the slogan Religion y Fueros, removed Gomez Farias from office. Federalists around the country declared themselves opposed to Santa Ana's new government, including the permanent commission of the state legislature of Coahuila y Texas, which sat at the state capital in Monclova. Saltillo's politicians, eager to regain control over the state government, responded to Monclova's declaration with one of their own, branding the state government there illegal. By the fall of 1834, limited fighting had broken out between militia units supporting Monclova and Saltillo, and Santa Ana had appointed his brother-in-law, General Martin Perfecto Cos, to restore order. Although a Federalist, Seguin had been willing to let Monclova handle its own fight against Saltillo. When the national government became involved, however, he could no longer hold back. The danger of centralist intervention in local affairs demanded action. A public meeting in San Antonio that month that declared a need for all Texas municipalities to decide on a course of action gave Juan the support he needed to openly demonstrate his Federalist leanings. He must have been sorely disappointed and confused by the response his call for a convention got from the Anglo-American parts of Texas. Neither the Department of the Brazos nor the Department of Nacogdoches responded. Seguin had not yet realized that although on the same side in opposing Santa Ana, he and his fellow Tejanos did not share the same motivations with the Texians. Throughout the summer and fall of 1835, the growing conflict between Texas and the national government was framed in terms of federalism versus centralism. In May, Seguin led a militia unit that included both Tejanos and Texians to Monclova to rescue the state government from the hands of Cos. Later in the year, when Cos arrived in Texas demanding the arrest of William Travis, Samuel Williams, Lorenzo de Zavala, and Jose Maria Carvajal, all associated with the Federalist cause, Juan must have been confirmed in his belief that Tejanos and Texians indeed had the same fight. Stephen F. Austin did not give him any reason to think otherwise, accepting Seguin into the ranks of the Army of Texas. Just when Juan came to the realization that few of the Texians had ever thought of the fight as a struggle for constitutional government is a mystery. While Travis's views were well known, he still commanded the Alamo under the flag that proclaimed the Federal Constitution of 1824 as its cause. And if he was shocked by the actions of the convention on March 2nd, 1836, that shock must have been tempered by the knowledge that two fellow Bejareños, Jose Antonio Navarro and Francisco Ruiz, had signed their names to the document. Consequently, the participation of Seguin and his men at San Jacinto must be viewed as an act of volition, the free choice to fight for an independent Texas. Having made up the rear guard of Houston's retreating army for over a month and a half, Seguin and his men could not have failed to notice that they were a minority of the Texas population fleeing Santa Ana's advance. Under different circumstances, the pieces of cardboard that Seguin's company wore in their head hatbands to identify them as friendly Mexicans might have been a cause for alarm. General Houston had actually asked Seguin to keep his company out of the battle to avoid any tragic occurrence of mistaken identity, given that the anti-Mexican feelings were running so high in the Texan army. Yet there were also signs of the possibility of cooperation and mutual respect between Texian and Tejano. At midday, the day of the battle, Colonel Rusk ate dinner with Seguin and asked for his advice. 
In his memoirs, Seguin dwells but briefly on the battle itself. Quote, my company was in the left wing under Colonel Sidney Sherman. We marched out onto the prairie and were met by a column of infantry. We had dispersed an ambuscade that had opened fire against us within pistol shot. The entire enemy line, panic struck, took flight. We were already on the bank of the river in pursuit of the fugitives when my attention was called to a Mexican officer who, emerging from the river where he had kept himself concealed, gave himself up and requested me to spare his life. Protected by weeds and grass, he seemed afraid to leave his shelter because of the fire which was being maintained against the fugitives. I ordered those who were close to me to cease firing, an order which was extended along the line to a considerable distance. Of the Tejanos' valor, we need not accept Seguin's own words. Quote, on this great and glorious day, my company was conspicuous for efficiency and gallantry, yet we did not lose a single man to the surprise of those who had witnessed our honorable and perilous situation. Houston, on more than one occasion, and now I'm beginning to have my doubts about how to use what he has to say, but you know, this is. <laughs> Houston, on more than one occasion, commented on Seguin's, quote, brave company in the Army of 1836 and his brave and gallant bearing in the Battle of San Jacinto with that of his men. Edward Burleson, this is the consensus business. This is why I think we can go ahead and trust Houston. Edward Burleson noted that there, and you'll have to pardon Ed, he, he wasn't quite literate, there is soldiers with us that has fought brave and has been faithful, and I should be pleased to see them enjoy liberty to the full extent. I mean, Captain Seguin's company and himself and all others that has been honestly engaged in the noble cause of freedom. There's no punctuation anywhere in there either. <clears throat> with their service on the field of battle, a score of Tejanos led by Juan Seguin purchased full citizenship and rights for all Mexican Texans in the New Republic. Unfortunately, the racism of westward migrating Anglo-Americans prevented Seguin and his men from fully enjoying the fruits of their victory. It would be many generations before their descendants could claim that citizenship and those rights won for them on the field of San Jacinto, which became a reality only as a result of the struggle of countless Tejanos who continued to fight for their rightful place in Texas society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. 